Okay, we're talking about fund development. So over the next 45 minutes or a little bit longer, a little bit less, we're going to talk about our philosophy of how do you develop funds. Notice I didn't say fundraising. We're not big fans of fundraising. We believe in fund development because it's, it's about relationships and it's about building an ongoing, uh, an ongoing relationship with stakeholders both in your community and outside of your community who make an investment in the betterment of kids and families and the like. So it's fund development. The strategy that we're going to unpack for you today is a very specific strategy. It came from uh, my own personal experiences. Uh, my wife and I had, uh, had, uh, had a vision of starting an elementary school for homeless kids or transitional families would be the mo more appropriate term. Um, and we didn't have any money. I mean, we had some money, but we didn't have any money for that project. And uh, it was going to take millions. And so the approach that, we, uh, that we're going to advocate today we raised $7.2 million in 28 months, and uh, we opened up an elementary school, a recreation and youth center, an adult education center, and a 44-unit housing complex. That was about uh, 11 years ago. And then we took that concept and deployed it with the Let Them Be Kids projects, excuse me, and communities, and it's been very, very effective. It is not the only way to raise funds but we think it's the most effective way for not only the short-term, but the long-term benefit. That we call it a relational fund development approach. It's all about relationships. Before we can get into the approach though, we've got to do some clarifying of some concepts. And I've got to take some ideas and lay them at your feet. Because today, the, the, the battle for the discretionary do donation dollar is more intense than it's ever been. I gotta write something down to remind myself. It's more intense than it's ever been. The battle for the discretionary donation dollar is more intense than it's ever been. And for your project or for, uh, for other projects to get noticed, you gotta put in a lot of time and energy and effort. So then what sets your project apart from other projects? And frankly, why should anybody give to you? Why should anybody in the world give a dime to your project? Well, because they love kids. Well, that's not enough today. There's all kinds of projects out there for kids. Well, because their kids would directly benefit. Yeah, but you and I both know just having the, 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 the parents won't be enough. So there are some things about today that are different than the past. One, as I said, the battle for the discretionary donation dollar is more intense than it's ever been. Two, and you can write this down, hopefully you have your handouts. Two, people give to people, not projects. People give to people, not projects. Three, people give to why, not how. People don't give their time, talent, and treasure to a slide. In other words, you're not, going to give, you're not going to get somebody to open up their checkbook for, a, for something that they don't believe is going to have a significant impact. People give to people and people give to, to whys, not hows. You combine that with the battle for the discretionary donation dollar being more intense than it's ever been, all of a sudden the traditional approaches to raising funds may not be as effective today as they were in the past. So we think that those things have to be taken into consideration if we're going to go out and do some fun development. Now we're not against selling cookie dough. We're not against nickel and diming parents. We just don't think it's the most effective use of your time. But over a period of time, if we're really going to generate the funds that we need to do all the wonderful things that we want, to have the impact that we desire, a different approach is necessary. We think this approach is the best approach, the one that I'll now unpack. Taking those considerations, those things into consideration, people give to people, people give to wise and not house, the battle for the discretionary donation dollar is more intense than it's ever been. So with those as a backdrop, some, some pieces of this strategy, some... Um, terms of reference.
First, evangelizing. We would suggest that in today's day and age, you have to be an evangelist. I'm taking that terminology out of its religious context, but I'm utilizing it and specifically evangelist. That means that we authentically, you can write this down, we authentically and sincerely tell people why we think this is important. Authentically and sincerely tell people why we think it's important. Why we think it's of value. That is why we challenge you to create desired outcomes first. Because it is those desired outcomes that set your project apart from other playground projects, other fundraisers that are happening in your area. And what defines you as a solid opportunity for someone to invest in. As a solid opportunity for someone to invest in. Those desired outcomes set you apart. They are the why that makes your project compelling. There is not a lack of resources out there. There's plenty of resources. How do, how do you know that, Ian? I just see all the Let Them Be Kids projects and how much money they raise. In, in, even in communities with 30 and 40 percent unemployment. So I know there's resources out there. There's literally organizations whose only mission is to give money away. That's why they have charitable status. That's why Canadian Revenue Authority gives them charitable status because their only role is to give money away. What are they looking for? They're looking for impactful projects that have compelling reasons for being done by authentic and sincere people. Well, that's you. You have a compelling project. You're authentic and sincere. And, and your project will make a significant impact not only in the kids' lives but in the neighborhood. Well, there's tons of funders out there that want a project like that. Their mandate is to give money to projects like that. So it's not a matter of a lack of resources. It's a matter of a, a lack of understanding of how to acquire the resources. So it all starts with evangelizing. And evangelizing starts with something you believe in. But it's difficult to believe in a how. We only believe in whys. That compelling. So you are an evangelist. And everywhere you go and in everything you do, between now and your build date, you're going to evangelize your message. But you're not necessarily going to do it in the typical evangelistic style, on a soapbox, you know, or like a used car salesman tracking everybody down you see to the point where people run away from you. No, that's not the approach that we're advocating. We're advocating a relational approach. But make no mistake about it, you are the evangelist. You're the person that authentically, sincerely, passionately tells people about why you think this is critical and vital and important. And some of the material I sent you, you saw the written evangelistic approach that one community was taking, Van Cleek Hill in, um, Van Cleek Hill in, uh, in Ontario. They actually wrote it out. But make no mistake. This mentality of authentically, sincerely, and passionately telling everybody you know. In your own style, in your own approach. And whether that's quiet or loud, that's up to you. But make no mistake, how do you do it? You tell people why you think this is important. So the first step for you in fund development is literally you writing down why is it important. If somebody asked me, what would I say? If I stood in front of the rotary, what would I say? If I talked to three moms at the school, what would I say? If I walked into a local shop at the local business owner, what would I say? What would I say from my heart that why this is important, valuable, and impactful? You got to come to terms with that first. Then, leveraging the Let Them Be Kids Award. The reason that the Let Them Be Kids Award is a 50-50 is so you can leverage that. So you're already winners. People want to be a part of a winner. So you've already won a national award, number one. Number two, you're already halfway to your goal, whatever that ends up being. And you have a specific time frame to create urgency. So you have a specific time frame. You've won a national award. And now you've got to evangelize the message of, come on, everybody. We're halfway there. We need your help. We have a specific time frame. Jump on board now. That makes for a, a compelling narrative, a compelling story. And again, that defines you in the marketplace in this highly competitive battle for the discretionary donation dollar. You already have a good story. 
So now it's just a matter of telling that story. So if you look at all those 18 documents that I sent you, in every one of them they tell that story. In other words, they say, we got a national award and it's 50-50, or it's 60-40 or whatever their award was. 50-50, 50-50, 50-50. If your dollar is like two, your hundred is like 200, your thousand is like 2,000, your 5,000 is like 10. Well, that makes funders, both big and small, excited. Funders, both big and small, get excited about that because they see a bigger bang for their dollar. They see a bigger bang for their dollar. Then we have to understand this concept as we continue the terms of reference before we talk about the strategy. The elevator pitch kind of dovetails off of what I said earlier. An elevator pitch, you know, you, my background, venture capital. And so the elevator pitch is where you would pitch a company. The concept is if I got on the first floor of a building in downtown Vancouver or downtown Edmonton or downtown Toronto or whatever, by the time we got to the 22nd floor, you'd understand clearly what I'm trying to do. You'd understand my company, you'd understand what we're trying to accomplish, and you'd understand what's special about us. That's that elevator pitch. Well, I would suggest that all of you need to be on the same page with your messaging. Those desired outcomes help with that. You clarifying your personal why helps with that. You then talking about it. Make sure we're all on the same page. So we go out and utilize this relational strategy. We have our elevator pitch down. And if somebody gives you 10 minutes to talk, you could talk for 10 minutes. If somebody gives you five minutes, if somebody gives you three minutes, if somebody gives you one minute. And you can accordionize that. Whether it's an informal conversation where you talk to a mom, or it's a more formal situation where you're talking to a major funder, or you're talking to a corporate uh, head, or whatever it is that you can adjust that elevator pitch to make the connection. Well, Ian, wouldn't it be easier just to have a bake sale? No. And I'll explain to you why in a moment. Because in one conversation with the right person of influence, you might get $5,000 and it would t in one conversation, whereas it might take you literally months or years. You want to watch an interesting video, watch the video of the Fort Erie. Watch Fort Erie video from last year and listen to the fire chief in Fort, Fort Erie say, we thought this was going to take us four years, we got it done in four months. When we first started with this project, when we first started talking about it, we thought it was going to be a four-year project and uh, then we got affiliated with Let Them Be Kids and Kool-Aid jumped in and uh, it's turned a four-year project into, a, into about a four-month project. We thought it would take us four years to raise the money. We got it done in four months. Why? Because of this more focused approach, more strategic and intentional approach. Understanding, continuing the terms of reference, marketing, traditional and alternative. So traditional takes into account that there are still people today that want to communicate via hard copy. Something more traditional, something they can touch and feel. There's people that want to communicate verbally, word of mouth. There's people that want to communicate through technology. So whatever we do, we want to hit all three of those conduits of communication. We want to have hard copy, traditional, but we also want to have alternative. That's more online, which is becoming more and more traditional today. That's your website. That's being able to make donations online, things of that nature. But in all three of those instances, the hard copy, that's the flyer, that's the packets that I've sent you, which we'll talk about in a moment, that's more traditional. The word of mouth and the alternative, or the word of mouth and the technology is more alternative. But in all three of those, the messaging is the same. The messaging doesn't change. It's just the conduit in which we push it through. We want to have multiple points of entry for people to get involved in your project. We want to have multiple points of entry and we want to reach to them proactively, building relationship with them. That's why it's so urgent for you to get people signed up. You got to get people signed up because that's how you get capacity. And then once you get that capacity, that's where it starts to fan out. And you can start using the alternative marketing to tell the people your good story of your compelling project and why it is so important and vital. 
and then you provide them with conduits to give their time, talent, and treasure, and then you get out of the way. See, that's fun development today. Well, does that mean we don't go around and ask for money? I don't think you go around and ask for money. You make people aware of the tremendous opportunity. You make them aware of the need. You make them aware of the potential impact. You create systems and processes for, to engage them and systems and processes for them to engage you. And then you just cheerlead the thing and evangelize it. And then before you know it, you've got great capacity. Media. How do we use the media? Now, if I haven't sent it to you yet, I think I have. But if I haven't, I will send you the media's tip sheet. Media and getting in the paper or getting on TV or being on the radio is not going to get you donations, in my opinion. But what it will do is third-party credibility. It will give you third-party credibility. In other words, when you go to talk to that business owner, when you talk to that mom, when you talk to these others, what, what they'll say is, oh, I saw that in the paper. Oh, I heard that on the radio. Hey, I saw you on CBC, or I saw you on television, or whatever. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Third-party credibility is what it gives you. It doesn't necessarily get someone to write a check just because they saw the TV. It is a support tool to give you credibility. Now look at the highly competitive marketplace for the discretionary donation dollar. Look at your credibility that might set you apart. One, you've received a national award. Two, you've got a pretty cool website, right? Because it used to be you had to have a brochure, and now you've got to have a website. You've got a pretty cool website. You've got video. You've got, you got video. You, you look good. Not only do you have a national award, but you're halfway to your goal. You're going to create a packet. I gave you tons of examples there. You're going to create a fund development packet that clearly articulates your project. We'll talk more about that in a moment. All of that gives you significant credibility. And then on top of that, they read about you in the newspaper, they heard about you on the radio, they saw you on the TV. Now you have clearly defined yourself in the donation marketplace. And if that business owner only has a dollar to give, he's got to decide where he's going to give it. Is he going to give it to you or someplace else? Well, you want to provide as compelling a reason as possible for him or her to give it to you. That foundation, that grantor, that institutional, you want to give them a compelling reason for them to give it to you. All of those things that I just described work to create a compelling reason for them to give it to you. On top of, of course, your desired outcomes, right? Okay. So we call this approach six degrees of separation. You've heard of, you know, Kevin Bacon, six degrees of seven. Everybody's six people away from Kevin Bacon. Remember that whole thing? Well, I believe that to be true. In other words, all of you know somebody or you know somebody that knows somebody that is a person of influence and a decision maker. Write this in some white space free of charge. The money is going to come to you from four avenues. Write this down. Very critical. The money is going to come to you from four categories. First, the school community. So write that down. School community. School community. Second, it's going to come to you from the broader community. So school community is parents, teachers, and supporters. Then you've got the broader community. That might be business, people in the area, stuff like that. People aren't necessarily connected to the school, but they're in the broader community who could see the project as a benefit. Then, events and fundraisers. Events and fundraisers. Events and fundraisers. Then, institutional donors. The let them be kids of the world. Institutional donors. Now, that could be governmental, that could be non-governmental, but large institutional donors. And what we have to sit down and talk about, and we'll talk about when we have our coaching session after this video, what we have to talk about is, how much money are you anticipating that you will raise within the school community? How much money will you raise in the broader community? How much money will you raise through special events and fundraisers? How much money will you raise from institutional donors? So we become strategic in our approach. And that, that information, 
becomes your projection and it becomes the tool from which you navigate with. Because obviously the next question after you've determined what your goal is in each category, obviously the next question is this, how are we going to do that? Right? Very simple. Right now we're talking about how to build your fundraising strategy, so pay attention. So, school community, how much? 10,000. Broader community, 10,000. Special events, 10,000. Institutional donors, 10,000. Well, then, of course, I'm going to say, how are you going to raise that 10000 Well, we're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do this. Okay, then the next question is, by when? And who's going to do it? So you know that, that the money's going to come from one of those four vehicles. That's it. They all boil down into one of those four vehicles. Then the next question is, how are we going to reach that goal? How, not only how are we going to do it, but then what's the action plan behind the how? And the action plan behind the how is when and who? In a, a very quick brainstorming meeting of an hour or two, you'll have your strategic plan, your fundraising plan. It's just that simple. But we would suggest that the approach be relational. Relational. What do you mean? Who do you know and who do we know that knows somebody? Who do we know and who do we know that knows somebody? We're going to encourage you to literally make a list. I've provided you with the tool. You see, $10,000 is just 100 people at $100. 100 people at $100 is $10,000. 100 people at $100 is $10,000. Look at some of those letters that you saw in the examples that school sent out to parents. I, I'm, the one that comes to mind is Eastview and Sault Ste. Marie. They literally just said, if everybody donates 75 bucks, we'll read our, reach our goal. And we won't have to bug you anymore with nickel and diming you, moms and dads. Everybody donates 75 bucks, we'll reach our goal. They raised $18,000 just with that letter. St. John's, St. John's in, uh, in Perth, Ontario, they sent out a similar letter, but they said this, we know that the, the Hershey plant closed here in town, so everybody's on tough economic times, but if everybody just donates $15 a month for the next four months, that'll be $60 a family, and if every family donates $60 in our large school, then we'll raise 18 grand or 15 grand or whatever it was. So they literally had families that just did a $15 check a month, postdated the checks, turned them in. Because $60 may seem a lot, but $15 a month they could pull off. So what's your point? My point is, each one of those buckets, we got to have a plan. So there's the school community, there's the broader community, there's the fundraisers and events, there's the institutional donors. Now here's the other inter interesting thing about when you build that plan. The other interesting thing of when you do that simple plan, how much, how are we going to do it, who's going to do it, and by when? When we use a relationship strategy, which we'll unpack a little bit more in a second, as the undergirding foundation, that tool, because you've put timelines on it, that tool becomes your navigational uh, device to help you know if you're on track or not. We said we were going to raise $10,000 within the school community. We said these were the mile markers of the timeline. Well, when we get to that point, we'll either have raised it or not. Are we on track or are we not? So there's two kinds of people in your group. On one end, you have people that think you're going to raise a million dollars. I'm exaggerating. Then you have people over here that think you're going to raise no dollars. I'm exaggerating again. Both are necessary perspectives. Both are important perspectives. Both are critical to what really matters, which is the dynamic tension in the middle. See, it's somewhere in the middle. You're not going to raise a million dollars, and you're going to raise more than zero. It's somewhere in the middle. If we pull too, too much to the optimistic, overly optimistic, that won't serve us well. And if we pull too far to the overly pessimistic, that won't serve us well. It's somewhere in between. We need both perspectives, but then both perspectives are a dynamic tension where somewhere in the middle is the reality. So at one hand, we want to believe that we're going to raise tons of money, but on the other hand, we want to be pragmatic and say we may not reach our goal. So that, be, by building that strategy, the simple strategy that I just articulated, as we move through the coming weeks and months, we will know if we are on track or not. 
Now, after you've done your dot democracy and after you get your initial design, what you're going to find is that every single piece Every single piece of the playground, fitness park, whatever, skate park, whatever, piece of equipment, every single little piece, the budget, the line item is there. So you know your portion to the piece. And then you combine your strategy, your fundraising strategy, and the navigation tool that it is with those dollar, that dollar amount and those specific pieces. So that if we raise 80% we're going to take these three things off the plan. If we raise 90%, we're going to take this one thing off. If we raise 60%, we're going to raise, take six things off. But you have that discussion now, not a week before your build. And the reason you do that is not only is it sound and prudent planning, but when you come to those places, you can go back out to all your stakeholders and say, hey, the, the plan and the design that the kids did Remember, let's give the kids what they asked for. That's another differentiating factor. You can say, because we're not on track to reach our fundraising goals, we will have to remove these three things the kids asked for. Invariably, people rally and make up the shortfall. Invariably. I've seen it happen over and over again. But you can't have that dialogue unless you do what? First, one, four buckets. How much are we going to raise in each bucket? And then, how are we going to do it? How much are we going to raise? The goal. How are we going to do that? And by when? That's called a strategy. Who's going to do it? And by when? Strategy. You take that and combine it with your dot democracy results and the initial design. And then as you move forward towards your build date, you're always comparing the two. Are we on track? Are we on track? So you're not flying blind. Now, you've heard me allude to this a couple of times, this relational strategy, making a list. We would suggest that you make a list because the list helps you with the first two categories, school community, broader community. And we work off of a relational strategy that says, who do we know? I gave you a sheet. Who do we know? Who do we know? Who do we know that could donate? Not will or would. Now, I got, I got to tell you, all committees push back at this point. Oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. Oh, I don't want to get out there and talk. I don't feel comfortable. I'll do 40 car washes, 300 bake sales. I'll stand on my head for three days before I go talk to somebody. Well, that's cool. I understand we all have different style. But guess what? The, four year, the, 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 the grade one student can't go advocate for themselves. They don't have the network we have. They don't know who we know. They don't have the voice that we have. And they don't have the influence that we have. They don't have any of that. They don't have any of that. So it's incumbent upon us within our own style and what we feel comfortable with. That's why we use the relational strategy. So we make a list. What do you mean make a list? You just sit down and who do we know? Who do I know that could donate 100 bucks? Not will, just could. Or who do I know that could donate 1,000? Who do I know that could donate 50? Who do I know? And the next thing you know, you will get a long list. And then the next thing is, who do I know that knows somebody? Who do I know that knows a decision maker? That if presented with a compelling idea of an impactful project done by authentic and sincere people would want to perhaps participate. That's huge. So you make the list. You make the list. The communities that have followed through on this raise tons of money in short periods of time. And they don't have to do a bunch of bake sales and events and activities. That doesn't mean they don't do them. Because that's just another conduit, another, another prong that people can connect. But this is the way to raise the money. 100 people, $100, $10,000. Five people, $1,000, $5,000. Three people, $2,500, $7,500. And I bet you when you made that list, you could probably name people that you know or know somebody who knows that could do those amounts. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we find out how much we really believe and love our kids because we have to step outside of our comfort zone and have to have some conversations with people. But follow me here. We're not advocating that you go ask people for money. What we are advocating is that you present them with a compelling story of why you are participating and then leave it at that. Look at all the examples that I gave you. All the examples that I gave you. 
They were different in their format. Some were packets. You had a brochure in there. Some were letters. They were all different in their approach, but they were consistent in their essence. They told of the award, they told of the match, they told of the compelling story, and then they told of the way people could participate. And what they got for their participation, that's important. What do they get for their participation? If they donate $100, what, they, what do they get? Well, they shouldn't get anything. They should just feel good about it. Come on now. Let's be realistic. So what do they get? Do they get permanent signage? Do they, what do they get for their $2,500 donation? What do they get? Now, that, what do they get is up to you, although I've given you tons of examples from all across Canada of what other communities have given. What you do is up to you. I don't know what you'll do. That packet... Whatever format it takes, letter, packet, brochure, I don't care. That packet is critical because not only does it bring your credibility, but it is the tool for engagement. Now, let me unpack this relational strategy a little bit more. So you've made a list of people you know or know somebody. And then once you've made the list, the next question is, who's going to go talk to them? Just who's going to go talk to them? Right? Who's going to go advocate for the kids? Who's going to go talk to them? Oh, I don't like that. Yeah, but follow me here. Because it's relational, you'll know. You'll know how to approach them. You'll know whether to just drop it by their office or drop by their house. You'll know whether to email it to them or you'll know whether to write it in a formal letter, put it in a packet and send it. Because you know them or you know, the, or you know somebody who knows them that can give you advice. And because you have some semblance of knowing them, either directly or through someone else. You also have credibility with them. You also have credibility with them. They'll at least give you their ear for a moment. But because you have desired outcomes, because you've won a national award, because you're halfway to your goal, because you have an impactful project that will make a significant difference done by credible people who are authentic and sincere, once they give you their ear for a minute, you'll have their ear for 15 minutes. And because you'll be able to present them with a packet that explains the project and what they get, that's all you have to do. And then you just leave it at that. And if they decide to participate, they decide to participate. So you're saying we don't ask? No, I don't think you ask. So, so I just set up a meeting? I don't know what you do because I don't know the person. You know the person. Or you know someone who knows the person. So whether they would advise or you think it's better to have a meeting, send a letter and then follow up phone call, whatever. But let me just tell you something, that beats the hell, excuse my language, out of just sending out a hundred generic letters to people we've never met or talked to. So you go ahead and do that strategy and I'll do this strategy and the battle for the discretionary donation dollar, our project will probably get the donations. Now that's not because I'm against your project, I just know there's only a few dollars out there to get and there's a battle for it. So I gotta, I gotta be the best that I can. We think this approach is the best that you can. Now, a couple of things talking about the packets, the examples that I've sent you. You'll notice that there are letters. We use the letters as the tool for engagement, but it's still relational. You'll notice there's a brochure. That brochure has only been ever used by one community. Duncan, Nova Scotia. Crystal Harris. I'm sorry, a Digby, Nova Scotia. Crystal Harris. And she promised me that a brochure was the key. And I was like, are you nuts? We've never had a community do that. Crystal, that will not work. She goes, it might not work anywhere else, but it works in Digby. So you'll notice that each one of those needs to be molded to what will work in your situation, in your community. But the reason we give you those examples is so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Many communities just take the letter half off and put their letter hat on and go. That's fine. That's the reason we give you the examples. But over the coming days, what we'll challenge you to do is build your tool. Whether it's a brochure, whether it's a letter, whether it's a packet, the key ingredients to whatever you do is clearly articulate your desired outcomes, clearly articulate the national award, clearly articulate the urgency, the date, clearly articulate the 50-50, clearly articulate the vision, and drop in there your initial design and be able to say, this is what the kids designed. So while you're doing your democracy, you're building that fund development packet so that when that, when that picture comes, you can drop it in, 
you've built your hit list, if you will, your, your, your donor, potential donor list, and you're ready to hit the ground and go. Yeah, but Ian, what about the special events and the institutional donors? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you got to do those things as well. Four buckets, right? But the majority of your money is coming from the first two buckets because it's the easiest. Well, it sounds hard. You know what? It's a lot easier to sit down and have a conversation with somebody you know. Once you overcome the trepidation and the fear, tell them the reasons why behind it or that business leader or that someone who you know that knows somebody. Go have that conversation than it is to put together a ton of bake sales. I'm not saying you don't feel more, you'll feel more comfortable doing it. I'm just telling you in the long term it's more effective. It is more effective. I've seen it play out literally 100 times. 100 times. Two things. The levels. You know, what do we give them? You can give them logo on your website, right? You got a website. When we do the national broadcast, you can put their logos in the national broadcast and we'll show you how to do that. Put them on the back of the t-shirt and although we don't supply the t-shirts, having t-shirts and put their logos on the back, that's awesome. You can give them permanent signage at the school. That's your choice. We're not advocating that. I'm just saying you could. You can give them signage on the day of. Based on those examples, based on those examples, you could do some cool things. I've already mentioned to you at the Dotmocracy some inexpensive thank yous that you could give out. Have the kids draw their favorite day of the playground. Put that in a frame. Give that as a thank you. Take a picture of all the kids in the school on the play structure the following Monday morning after the build. Put that in a frame. Have the kids put it in a matted frame. Have the kids sign the outside of the matting, the matting, right? Have them sign it. Johnny, grade one. Hakeem, grade two. Juan, grade one and then give that as a thank you. What does that cost? That costs a frame at Walmart, eight bucks. And somebody takes a digital camera and you get it processed at wherever you get film processed. It costs nothing. Don't give away plaques. Give away something that's meaningful and purposeful and will touch people's heart if you're gonna give that kind of recognition. So, clearly define what they get and clearly define some inexpensive thank yous. You've got great ones that you could give. Now. We're going to build a video for you. You could also give that video. And we don't, I don't want to take a long time to talk about the video, but you could also give that video as a thank you because we're going to create a video for you just like you've seen other communities and their videos. Here's the simplicity. Relational. Why? Because people give to people and people give to whys, not hows. And in today's competitive environment, sending out hundreds of letters to people you've never met is a shotgun approach which will not get you what you need. You need to take a more intentional focus strategy by making that list. But in making that list, we're all on the same page with our elevator pitch and we evangelize that message. We create a tool that we can utilize that tells the good story of what we're doing and has those keys that I mentioned. And then we use that tool to have the dialogue. How does that dialogue go? It's pretty simple. Because we understand the at least to some degree or another, how they communicate, how they communicate, and let me dovetail on that for just a second. Are they a fact-based communicator, an emotion-based communicator, a belief-based communicator, or are they a values-based communicator? Because you have some semblance of a relationship with them, you'll know what their communication style is, and when you sit down to have a, a, a dialogue with them, you'll adjust your style to meet theirs. Remembering that how you approach them is also based on that relational knowledge. Do you drop it off their office? Do you send them an email? Do you send them a formal letter? And when you sit down and talk with them, that packet is the tool. So that conversation goes something like this. Thank you for meeting with me. I'm so excited to be a part of this project at the school. We think it, I think it's important because I am involved because I have donated because. In addition, we've received this national, national award that, that, that allows us to take what we thought was going to take a long time and make it a very short period of time. The fact is the bill day is blank day. We have between now and then to raise as much money as we can so that we can get it matched by this national organization. Here's what the playground design or the fitness park or the skate park or whatever it is that the kids put together and then you tell them about that. And then you say, here's all the different ways that someone could participate. 
I'm going to leave this packet with you. They'll ask some questions, you'll answer them, and that'll be it. And then let it go from there. Well, what about online? It's the same. It's just the conduit that you're using is online. You're telling the good story on your website. You're sending out the weekly updates once you get to 20 registrants. You're getting as many people registered as possible so that they can forward the information to others in their network of people. So the face-to-face -face approach and the online approach are the same. It's just that the conduits are different. And that's why you want that online donation button. And whether you link it to PayPal or you link it to something else, that's up to you. At the end of the day, you're engaging people. You're telling them compelling reason of why they um, would benefit, they would benefit from participating in your program on a lot of different levels. Final thought. People give to people. And if you're afraid or you're nervous or you're uncomfortable with the approach that I just articulated, I would ask you to think of the following. I have I have yet to meet anybody that's excited about going out and raising money. But the kid can't. The kid can't. So whenever I get nervous, whenever I feel intimidated, whenever I feel down, whenever I feel rejected, I think of that. I think of the fact that I am an advocate for kids. And because the project is worthy, has meaning, and because we have broader outcomes, than just building a slide, but we're trying to impact a neighborhood or you're trying to impact a neighborhood or a community, school or otherwise, then this becomes less about me and more about the impact and trying to keep that in the forefront of my mind. And in addition to that, I think of the opportunity that I'm providing this potential donor or giver to be a part of something special to be connected to something that will literally change lives. It's just been beyond our wildest dreams. We've had over 200 people come out today to help us build this playground and clean up the beach and do plantings of gardens, and it's just been a fantastic day. When I think of those two things, all of a sudden I'm not so nervous anymore. All of a sudden I believe enough that I can talk to just about anybody. All right. Whether you're watching this live right now or whether you're watching this taped, we're now going to go into the coaching where we'll talk about some questions and answers. Uh, we'll talk about some questions and hopefully I'll be able to provide some answers. We'll get on the phone and we'll talk to you in a few. Thanks, everybody.